All right, welcome to week three. Um, we're going to be taking on normalization this week, which is uh, an interesting topic um, in the sense that a lot of people have a hard time grasping it at first and what all the terminology means. Um, but specifically today, we're going to go through what normalization is, what anomalies are, uh, what the th most common normal forms are, the steps to normalize, and then there's like an example blended into all of this. Okay, so normalization is a tool. Primarily, it's a tool designed to validate and improve a logical design of a database so that it follows certain constraints and it avoids unnecessary duplication of data. And the process of decomposing relations with anomalies to produce smaller well-structured relations is known as normalization. So summarize these two slides in plain English. It means that we, the goal of normalization is to make it so that whenever you need to take, make a change in the database, it happens in one place. That change is not going to duplicate data, make data go missing, et cetera, et cetera. And it should be a bunch of smaller entities instead of one big fat entity. So that's essentially what it means in plain English. So I'm going to talk about anomalies. So to talk about anomalies, we need to understand um, what a well-structured well -structured relation is first. And by relation, I don't mean a relationship. It's a relation is a synonymous with an entity or a table. So when you go from an entity, it turns into a relation, which turns into a table. They're all essentially the same thing at just different stages in its life cycle. Um, essentially, a well-structured relation contains the minimal amount of data red redundancy, allows users to insert, delete, and update rows without causing in any kinds of inconsistency. So the goal is to avoid anomalies. And an anomaly is a problem that exists in a database that hasn't been normalized yet. And a really good rule of thumb is that any given table in a database should only ever contain data about one thing. So a table should only ever pertain to one entity type. If we're going to use like the terminology from last week and the week before. In other words, we don't want to have a table that has data about a customer, a tech support agent, and an order that was placed at the same time. That makes no sense. It's too hard to manage. So there are three kinds of anomalies. There's an insertion anomaly. So an insertion anomaly happens when you add a new row to a table and you end up having to create duplicated data that really doesn't need to be duplicated. For example, at a dentist's office, imagine that when we add a new dentist, we also have to give them a patient. And if we had a patient, we also had to have a dentist at the same time because some no reason that dentist's office decided to contain everything in one table. So that would what would happen is every single time you had a new patient, you'd be duplicating the dentist, which is really, really bad. Um, a deletion anomaly happens when um, you delete a row of data and you lose an unrelated piece of information permanently. Um, I'm, some of the examples I have later, uh, it'll make more sense. But imagine if we had a table that had a list of employees and a list of departments, but it's all one table. So suddenly we del we fire off the last employee for a given department. Suddenly that department no longer exists because we deleted the last instance of that department in the database. And an update or modification anomaly means you want to change one piece of information, you end up having to change multiple rows. Uh, for example, somebody just got a raise, but they just so happen to be in the database twice because of some unrelated anomaly. Um, so that means you'd have to update their salary twice instead of once. Um, nowadays, computers are fast enough that the odds of something going horribly wrong while that is happening, is pretty low. Um, but back in the day, and this is before my time, 
I know it's hard to imagine, but before my time, when computers stored data on magnetic tape. So before we had hard drives, everything was on magnetic tape. So you've probably seen movies, you know, when they're in a computer room and the tapes are rolling back and forth. So what would happen is if you had duplicated data, it would have to move that tape many times. And if the computer A, crashed, B, the tape broke, and yes, that did happen, suddenly the updates would fail because it never finished the job. So suddenly you have the data in, in a weird state. So that's why you want to try to avoid update anomalies. That's because they're duplicating data. That means you have to make changes more than once. All right. So here's an example. We have a list of employees, some salaries, some courses that they've taken, and the dates they completed them. Now, before I go any further, is this technically a proper relation? Technically, yes. Every single row in there is unique. It could be identified. It could be found. Now, some people will say, well, what about this case over here where we got this empty row? Well, as it stands in this current structure, it's the only empty row. That means we'll never be able to put in another empty row. So we can never have another employee that hasn't had any training yet. So we can only ever have one untrained employee at a time. So when we look at this, uh, what's the primary key? Well, we actually end up having a combination of the employee ID and the course title. So if we want to find any given row in here, we can do it by combining the employee ID and the course title. It's not ideal because the employees are duplicated. Some of the course titles are duplicated, but the combination of an employee and a course title is not. So it's a composite key. It's not great. Uh, we'd want to try to avoid that as much as possible. So here are the three kinds of anomalies. There's an insertion anomaly. We can't add a new employee without adding a course for them, regardless if it's an existing course or a new course. Why? Because Lorenzo Davis is the only person right now that has no uh, courses set. So that means the next person going in has to have a course. When you hire a new employee, excuse me, try not to sneeze. When you hire a new employee, often they don't have training courses done yet. Literally, they just got hired. They still have to do the corporate training. Therefore, they're not going to have the courses they need to take. Therefore, how can you, in this situation, we wouldn't even be able to put someone in. So we'd have to put them in with a, with a dummy course. Deletion anomaly. So if we go in turf employee number 140, which happens to be Alan Beaton. So Alan Beaton was found to be rounding off checks and sending them to himself. So they said, Alan Beaton, you got to go. So if we delete on Alan Beaton, we get rid of this whole row, you'll notice that suddenly tax accounting is only in this list once. So if we fire Alan Beaton, we lose the fact that tax accounting was even a course that was ever offered. That's a deletion anomaly. When we delete one piece of data and it takes something else with it that you may need again later, it's not great. Um, and then an update anomaly which is we're going to give a raise to employee number 100. So right up here, Margaret Simpson gets a raise from 48,000 a year to, I don't know, say 52,000 a year. And we have to, we have to actually update her salary twice. Now picture back in the day where a computer, a database update for, you know, two rows would take more than a thousandth of a second where it literally had to move tapes back and forth, or hard drives the size of this table, which were not very fast. They were a lot faster than tape, but they were still not fast, like what you guys think of as fast. And suddenly we update the first one and it fails before it updates the second one. So suddenly Margaret Simpson has two salaries in the system. So is she earning 48,000 a year or earning 52,000 a year? Because the system had an unhappy day. We don't know what Margaret's salary actually is. That's an update anomaly where if things go wrong and we have to update more in one place, 
things have gone horribly wrong. Oops. So why do these anomalies exist? If we turn, if we go back and we look at this, we can realize that really this table has two kinds of entities in it. We have employees, which is this chunk, and then we have the courses that the employees took. Instead of having it as a single entity, they should be really two separate entities with a relationship between them. And that would allow us to update a person's salary in one place, hire a person without having to create a course for them. Um, you know, if we fire someone, we may not lose the fact that they took tax accounting. So why should we remove anomalies? So the main purpose of a database, of course, is to store and retrieve data. Literally, that's its purpose in life, is you put data into it, you pull data out of it. And to be able to, for the database to do its job right, we need to do this in an efficient and accurate manner. So a database that is not properly designed has a few problems because of the anomalies. Efficiency, multi-key retrievals are slow. They make the queries run slower. Having lots of data in a single table can also make the queries come back slower. Uh, data integrity. In theory, it's possible to have duplicated data. Therefore, how would you summarize data when there's certain pieces of information duplicated? We'd fire an employee. Suddenly, we lose some information. Therefore, now we're missing or it's now inaccurate. Ease of use. Uh, this is the one that actually the programmers care about the most. Having to write complicated queries really sucks. As a person who's written some very complex queries in his career, writing really complicated queries and against an unnormalized database is terrible. So it'll make the database easier to use, not for the end user, but for the developers. They don't have to sit there and try to code around badly planned database structures. So now we've talked about the anomalies, any questions about what the anomalies are before I start diving into the rest? Do you have a question? Yeah. That is an anomaly. So that's a deletion anomaly. So if we delete Alan Beaton out of the system, we're also going to lose the fact that tax accounting ever existed. It's a part of the key. So it has to be deleted. It can't be left behind. Therefore, because A, it's part of the key, and B, it can't be deleted because it's part of the key. When you delete Allen, you have to take up that whole row and you can't leave this behind. So now what happens is because we have to delete the entire thing, we're going to lose the fact that tax accounting was a choice. No, but the thing is, it's because the key is Alan Beaton could never take tax accounting twice. So the combination of 140 plus tax accounting is unique. 100 plus SPSS. Yep. So oh, as it stands right now, we have to just go with what's here and not try to improve it. The employee ID plus the course title combined is the key, end of story. So when we delete one row, we're losing both pieces of that key. Now, if somebody else took that course, that side is not going to lose it. 
but we're going to, that employee's not going to have it anymore. But it, like I said, like earlier, Alan Beaton is the one that's really bad because if we def fire him, we lose one of the pieces, the key. Those, those values are arbitrary. It could be anything that's in that column as long as it's unique for the combination of the employee ID and the course title. Okay. Normal forms. So the normal forms are the steps, is basically the name given to the steps in the process of normalization. And the goal is to reduce redundancy and remove anomalies. So a well-designed database is considered to be well-designed when it's at the third normal form or voice cod. So voice cod is an in-between normal form. There is first, second, third, voice cod, fourth, fifth, sixth, and then some other weird ones past that. Essentially, everything past third normal form has been created to handle specific edge cases. If you don't know what an edge case is, it means it's a, it's a set of conditions that doesn't happen very often, and it only happens under specific conditions. That is an edge case. So what we are going to, what the goal is, you want to at least get the third normal form. And if you can, voice cod. Voice cod is only ever handled for specific uh, circumstances. Um, the cool thing is, is that often for a lot of database tables, when you get the third normal form, you'll also be in voice cod fourth and fifth automatically. Because the things that cause fourth and fifth to happen are so rare that you could automatically get upgraded. So we resolve this by, well, we, we choose the normal forms by resolving the dependencies. So there's a couple of different kinds of dependencies and I'll be talking about those in a minute. And don't forget about strong and weak entities. There's foreign key relationships also to resolve those kinds of issues. So, we have functional dependencies and keys. So a functional dependency is when the value of one attribute determines the value of another attribute. For example, here at the school, your student number determines your name. It determines your email address. It determines your phone number. So at the school, your determinant is your student number. It's a can and then it's Canada key because it's not a primary key until later in. Um, but normally one of the Canada keys will often become a primary key. And sometimes you'll have multiple Canada keys. So you may end up having, you know, a credit card number and a SIN number in a given table, and both could be Canada keys. And as a person that has to deal with um privacy issues and data safety, don't ever put a credit card number and a SIN number in the same database table. Even better, never put those in a database table if you can, if you can avoid it. Uh, the less of that kind of information you have, the less liable you are. Just, that's a pro tip. <laughs> um, each non-key is functionally dependent on every candidate key. So, so this means that for every column that is not a primary key, it has to depend on every piece of the candidate keys. It'll make more sense once I get examples up on the screen. So first normal form means that there are no multi-valued attributes and every attribute value is atomic. So no multi-valued attributes. So remember, a multi-valued attribute is an attribute that's a list. For example, an employee has a set of skills. They might be listed in as common delimited list. It might be in as a multiple entries, uh, that kind of thing. That's a big no-no. So we don't want to store a list because then we'll have duplicated data, nulls, that kind of stuff. And every attribute is atomic. It means that every attribute is self-contained. It's not made up of multiple pieces. 
So currently, when we look at this table, this is not in first normal form, specifically because the skill is a list. So you can see right here that this employee ID has this and two items. John has Python and Alice has JavaScript and Python. So you have this combination. So this is actually a list. It's not in first normal form because there's a list. So how do you fix it? Is you fully populate the table. It's not a big change from this to this, except we make sure that every row is fully populated. So currently, this table is considered to be in first normal form. There's a determinant, which is an employee ID. And the name and the skill both depend on the employee ID. Realistically, it's not a good table because this is still hard to retrieve and their skill should actually be part of the key. Um, but it is technically in first normal form. So there are no lists. In other words, there's no multi-valued attributes. And there are no null values. So that is first normal form. So second normal form means that every non-key, well, actually, first of all, you can't be in second normal form unless you're in first normal form. It might come as a shock to some people, but you know, you can't be a super saiyan unless you're a saiyan first. That's just how it works. And it's the same thing in normalization. You cannot be in second normal form unless you've at least achieved first normal form. Every non-key attribute is fully functionally dependent on the entire primary key. So this means that each column in your table must be fully dependent on the entire primary key. There can be no partial functional dependencies. It'll make more sense when I bring up a bit of an example. And when I'm done going through the normal, I've actually got a full set of examples to go through that will help explain this a bit better. So there are no multi-valued attributes. Great, we took care of that with first normal form. Partial dependencies are removed. So in this case, we'll notice that the student ID is dependent on the course ID. The course name is also dependent on the course ID. So there are actually technically two entities in this table. We got the student and the course. What should actually happen is there should be, you'd break it out like this. So if we go here where the course name depends on the course ID and the combination of student course ID, student ID has nothing to do with the course name, right? Course name has nothing to do with student ID. That means course name is a partial dependency. It's dependent on part of the key. So even here, when you look at it, we've got student ID and course ID as the entire primary key. We have this course name, which is only dependent on part of the key. If it's dependent on part of the key, then it's a partial dependency. Partial dependencies are bad. We don't want that because it causes grief. How do you fix it? You break it into smaller pieces. So we now have a table called well, table for courses. So we have the course ID and the name. And then we have the student ID and the course ID. So student is taking this course, that student's taking that course. And we could actually change the description of the course without affecting anything up here. We could unenroll student one, two, three, four out of 8250 without losing the fact that database design is the name of the course. So you resolve partial dependencies by removing them to its own thing. So a third normal form. Again, you can't be in third normal form unless you are in second normal form. And then there are no transitive dependencies. Transitive dependencies, when people are learning normalization, transitive dependencies is the hardest one people get to understand. And it's be, transitive dependencies happens when uh, a primary key is a determinant for another attribute, which is then determines under third attribute. That sounds pretty dumb, but let's, let's turn it around this way. To determine the value of a field, you have to go through its determinant, 
which then goes to another one. The second you go from this value is determined by this and determined by that, that's a transitive because you had to actually have two determinants in a row to figure out, not the combination of determinants. You actually have to go from one determinant to another determinant to eventually figure out, you know, what's related to what. So what do we do with transitives? We take it, rip it out, put it in its own thing. And you, you can figure it out with a bit of uh, logic, which is A determines B and B is determined by, uh, sorry, A determines B, B determines C, therefore A determines C. Because A determines B and B determines C, therefore automatically A determines C. Therefore we're doing a transition through one key to another key to determine it, therefore that's why it's transitive. All right, so third normal form, there are the partial dependencies are removed, there's no multivalued attributes, and the transitives are removed. So right now, we have site ID determines the contractor, the contractor determines the fee. Therefore, the site determines the fee, which is not great. The contractor determines the fee, but the way this table is designed is that basically the fee is determined by the contractor, the contractor is determined by the site ID. So when you say this is determined by this, which is determined by that, you have a transitive. It's not the fee is determined by the site and the contractor. It's this is determined by this, and this one is determined by that. So that is a transitive because you got to transit through one key to get to the other key. Thus, it's transitive. So how do you fix that? Easy. You break into its own piece again. So the contractor is tied to a site, the fee is tied to a contractor. Technically now we are in um, third normal form. You're gonna to start to see a pattern here. You get rid of each kind of anomaly or uh, dependency by breaking it out to its own piece. Literally, that's all you're gonna do is you're gonna take this, break it, take the next step, break that down. Basically, you're gonna keep breaking things down until everything is dependent Everything in a given table is dependent on the primary key, the entire primary key, and no sub piece of the primary key. Um, in this case, this also achieves voice COD, BCNF, because there are no of the edge cases. Now, voice COD normal form, it's a relation that has more than one candidate key. Basically, anomalies can result, even though the relation's in third normal form. So when you have a relation that has two candidate keys, back to our example with a SIN number and a credit card, and if they're both potential candidate keys, we'll end up with a case where either of them are valid, but they may be needed for different parts of that table. So that is the anomaly or the issue that Boyce Cod is designed to resolve. So for something to be in voice COD, the final rule is every attribute or field depends on the key and nothing but the key. Um, in industry, voice COD is sometimes known as normal form three and a half because it's between third and fourth normal forms. All right, so back to our third normal form table. So, a relation is in voice code when every attribute or field depends on the key, nothing but the key. So site contractor is third normal form and it's in voice code because it depends on the key and only the key. The contractor, on the other hand, doesn't have a primary key. Therefore, it's not in voice code because it doesn't have a primary key yet. So we create a primary key by basically defining the contractor as a primary key. Now, the other thing that we do at the same time is we might want to actually create a unique ID for the contractor. And in this case, we chose to create a synthetic key. The synthetic key allows us to detach ourselves a little bit from the data. So we gave it a contractor ID. We moved the contractor ID into this original table. So when we looked over here, see, 
original table had the contractor here and here. So we were duplicating the data in two places, which is not great. So instead we created a key here, created a foreign key here. And now the name depends on the ID and the fee depends on the ID. Therefore, all the values here depend on the key and only the key. This table is a, an associative entity. Basically it has uh, keys from two different sources that make up its primary key. And it's technically in voice cod. All right, so now we're gonna go through an example to help bring this home a little bit better. All right, so this diagram. So we got a table multi-valued attributes. So remove the multi-valued attributes. We're in first normal form. Remove the partial dependencies. We're in second normal form. Remove the transitives. We're in third normal form. Normally by now, the database is in pretty good shape. If we remove the remaining anomalies, we're in voice cod. And then we have fourth and fifth, which we're actually not going to talk about in this class. But this diagram shows the rest of them. So there could be multi-value dependencies. Uh, there could be some remaining anomalies, with which will bring us to fourth and fifth. And there are cases where um, there is actually sixth and seventh, but usually those are only seen in academia. In other words, some professor, some person needed to do a PhD, so they had to come up with some reason. So they invented two more normal forms to justify their PhD. They said, yeah, so if you see this edge case of a data situation, which will never actually happen in the wild, you're going to use the new normal form I created to resolve this problem. Here you go, sir, have a piece of paper. That's essentially how sixth and seventh normal forms came to be. Well, the third, first, second, and third normal form is usually good enough. Sometimes you'll have the odd case where you need to do something where you have multiple primary keys. So then you do the last step to voice cod it. And normally the easy way to fix things to bring them to voice cod is to give everything a synthetic key. If everything has a synthetic key, everything's in voice cod. And then after that, it's just gravy after that. You don't need to think past that point, really. Like I said, it's fourth and fifth are edge cases where we have some odd things where that even though we did all the right steps, now we just have some strange things that are left behind that somebody came up with some rules to clean those up. Yeah. Okay, so we have a table with multi-valued attributes and it's not in first normal form. And this might come as a shock to you guys. This example here came from a textbook that we used to use in a different course. It was the same textbook we used when I went through school, when I learned this stuff in 1995. That's how much this has not changed. Like there is the exact, exact, exact same example my prof used, except it's having a nice projector. He had overhead slides. Remember the cellophane slides on top of the projector and he literally put the slide down and he'd be writing on the slide for his examples so much better because i can't write on that screen um sometimes you know some of the old technology was better than today's technology so over here we have one so we have a table and it's not a proper relation because we have multi-valued attributes in other words this chunk on the right here is um Order ID 106 contains three things. Order 107 contains two things. So it's not considered a proper relation because we have whole blocks of nulls in here. How do you fix it? You fill it all in. So at this point, it is a relation, yes. It is now technically first normal form. Is it really good? No, it's terrible. And in a few minutes, I'll we'll go over why this is really terrible. So it is technically a relation, it's technically in first normal form, but it's not very good. Uh, one of the other rules of first normal form is that you should have the candidate key defined. So the identifiers are defined. 
Over here we have order ID and product ID. So after looking at this data, we realize that if we do the combination of order ID plus product ID, we can find any given unique row. Because the way it's set up is for every order, you cannot put the same product in the order twice. You put in the same product. If you want two of them, you put in a quantity of two. You don't put in you don't put it in twice. So each product is in the order once. Therefore, the combination of order ID plus product ID gives us a pretty good key to start with. So now, we can identify all the bits and pieces that are in here. So we can look at what's fully dependent on the main key. So we know the order ID and the product ID is the key. So when we look at it, we'll realize that only the quantity is fully dependent on the product and the ID. There's some partial dependencies where the product description, the finish, and the price is only dependent on the product. These three columns have nothing to do with the order ID whatsoever. Therefore, those are partial dependencies. Over here, we have another partial dependency. Basically, the order ID, the order date, the customer ID, customer name, and address. Those ones are only dependent on the order ID and not the product ID. Therefore, that chunk is partially dependent. There's also a transitive, but I'm not going to deal with the transitive till later. So order ID determines the order date, customer ID, customer name, customer address. Customer ID, well, I guess we are going to talk about it. The transitive dependency, customer ID determines the name and the customer address. The product ID describes the product description, finish, and standard price. And then order ID and product ID determines the quantity. Is that kind of clear looking at that, how everything is interrelated with all those arrows? So each, each piece is only dependent on part of the key except for the quantity in the end. So to get into second normal form, we need to get rid of the partial dependencies. So we would take this big entity, which is terrible, and break it into three pieces for now. So we're getting rid of the partial dependencies. We're not going to deal with the transitives yet. We're only going to worry about the partials because until you get really, really good at working with data, you want to do this in incremental steps and not do it like I would do it, which is look at it and go, yeah, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here. You do this for 26 years. As part of your job, you get some of this stuff becomes automatic, right? You don't think about the normal forms anymore. It just happens. But until you get to that point, you need to understand the parts to break it down. So once we get rid of the partial dependencies, we create three entities out of one. We have one we decided to call order line. So the order quantity depends on the product ID and the order ID. So this is fully dependent on the entire key. That means it's in third normal form. Congratulations. We don't even need to think about order line anymore. It's fixed. So the product ID. So we know the standard price, the finish, and the description depends on the product ID. Therefore, that one, these three columns are fully dependent on the product ID. Therefore, it's also in third normal form. Great. We don't need to think about products anymore. Now we just have the last one where we have the transitive dependencies. The order date. And the customer ID is determined by the order ID. The customer name and the customer address is determined by the customer. So for the transitive, to figure out the customer address, we have to go from the order ID to the customer ID to the customer address. So we're transiting from one determinant to another determinant to get to the actual value. So now, even though that particular entity is in second normal form, we're not done with it yet. We want to get it to third normal form. <clears throat> so how do we fix it? We take it and break it into two pieces. You're starting at the pattern here, right? Just take it, break it down to smaller pieces so that everything is atomic. So the order ID, the customer ID and the order date for a given order ID, these two are fully dependent on this key. Great, it's in third normal form. The customer address and the customer name are fully dependent on the customer ID. 
So when we look at this slide over here, which is really, really small, uh, if you downloaded the slides, it's probably bigger on your screen. Um, we actually have an ERD of this. So we have this table here has a customer can have zero or more orders. Each order belongs to one and only one customer. An order can have one or more products. Each product, like each order line belongs to one and only one order. Each product can be assigned to zero or more order lines. Each order line can ever be assigned one and only one product. So that's what that diagram is showing. And I actually have another set of examples, but I'm gonna actually do them on the board. So I'll leave the original data up on the screen, then we'll do it on the board. So. When we look at this table, it is in third normal form. However, there's functional dependencies. So we have the, the uh, student ID and the major determines the advisor and the major's GPA and the advisor determines the major. So because of this, that is not an ideal situation. So we need to basically break it down. So to bring it to Boyce Cod, we need to break it down one more time. So we end up with a student with an advisor and their major's GPA, and then the advisor determines the major. So we break it down so that the major is only ever determined by the advisor. And over here, the advisor is just a relation, so we don't need to have it as a separate table. All right, so. Those are the normal forms. Now I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna pull up an example so I can go through it on the board. Okay, so this is an example that has a bit of everything. At least I hope it does. I literally whipped this together 10 minutes before leaving out of the house. So it might be a little rough, guys. I haven't even tried to normalize it yet. Um, I was planning to do it earlier today and I was stuck on a conference call till uh, 3.15, 3.30. So it was a little rough. Okay, so we have a, a relation here that is not in first normal form. Why is it not in first normal form? We have nulls. So we have blanks in here. So to fix it, we want to, I'm gonna grab this and actually put it in a separate tab. Essentially we need to fill in every row. Okay, so now we're almost in first normal form. We're almost there because we don't have any more nulls anymore. So each row is identifiable. However, we are unable to determine specific things. Um, and in this case, what would we be able to do to determine our candidate key. So which would be our columns we have to use? And we're doing this together. Like I said, I haven't even normalized this yet. So I don't know if this is a well thought out example. So what would be the columns in here we'd use to determine each unique row? Okay, so we'd have column A and you sure about that? Because even as it stands, if I went select star from this table where employee is one and project's equal to 55, we'll still end up with double rows because we can't find a specific row yet. So really this is actually a three part key. Um, like I said, this was probably not the best example, but you know, that's what happens when you wing an example on the fly. So really we need to, all three columns. We need three columns to make our candidate key. So now we're technically in first normal form. So I'm gonna take this and write it out on my really anemic whiteboard. Oh, 
colors. So we have employee, an actual uh, first column is actually employee number. And I know that's really small. Let me try to write that bigger. I really suck at writing big on the board. We have skill project number project name task and time all right so now we got to figure out our partial dependencies. So we know, and actually, let me just. Uh, we decided these were our keys. So we know that the employee name is only dependent on the employee number the employee email, and apparently the skill. The project name is only determined by this. And our time is actually fully dependent. So that one is good news. So the time depends on the entire key. Green marker's almost dead. Okay. All right. So this is our situation we have right now. And we actually do have a transitive in here, but we'll deal with that in a minute. So right now, the way to fix this would be to take everything that has orange and break it into its own piece. So I am going to draw a line. And we're going to start creating our entities again. So first things first, we're going to take care of the one that's fully dependent. So we have EMP number, project number, task, and time. And we know that this is fully dependent. Really? I tried, I failed. Okay, let's hope this marker survives. I just gotta go slow. So we have, interesting. Come on. Apparently, I got to move my mouse more often. All right, so we created this entity here. It's in third normal form. We are happy that it's in third normal form. Now we're going to take our next one, which might as well be the project one.
Again, that is fully dependent. My project name, it helps if I spell it right. All right, so we're taking the care. So we have this last one here, which is the employee one. So we're going to go. So we know for a fact that we have this situation. Now the problem that we have is skill. Skill is actually a strange edge case, which I didn't realize I was going to make an example with first with fourth normal form in it. Oops. I realized it as I was writing it all out on the board. So what happened is when we look at it, we can see over here that there is the skills are there. They're determined by the employee number, but it's actually a list of values. These are multi-valued attributes. So what's happened is technically this is in third normal form. We are in third normal form, except we have multi-values under the list, the skill. So realistically what should happen is there should be another table for skill to actually do it right, which I was not planning on doing a fourth normal form example. Sorry guys. That's what happens when you don't plan ahead. Let's go. What we need to really do to fix this problem, because right now we can pull up any given employee because each employee is going to be in the system. They're still going to be in the system twice because of each of the skills. So we need to figure out the fact that to be able to identify the employee, we need to basically we have a field that has no key. So we want to actually take the skill, take it out of here, and go. We need actually to create two more tables. We need one with a skill number and a skill, and then the employee number and the skill number. So that this become turns into a boy's cod. This one is self-contained. Now, if I were to draw this as a database diagram, which will probably make more sense to you guys once you actually see it, it looks something um, like this. In actual fact, you know what? I'll do it here so you don't have to deal with my handwriting. Yes. At this point here, Yes, but the, each employee can only be assigned one skill. So the combination of these two, the employee can be in multiple times. Each skill can be in multiple times. The combination of each employee and each skill can only be there once. It'll, and you know what? I'll prepare a better example for next week. So I'm going to create a new, di a new diagram. All right, I'm going to create my first table. And we are going to call this one, uh, mm, we'll start with the employees. And we're going to have an employee number. I'm just following my naming conventions on the board. <clears throat> and I'm not paying attention to the data types. I just want to, so you guys can visually see what we did. Okay. So now we're going to create another table. Slap that on here. We're going to call this one project.
something like that. What else do we have? We have <laughs> essentially we're trying to identify all the the uh, strong entities first. So the next one would be skills. Like that. So, so far we've taken care of all the strong entities that don't have any child records. <laughs> Specifically, we've taken care of this one, this one, and this one. So I'm going to take care of this one first. So I'm going to throw in a table here um, and it disappeared. Hello. Come on. All right, I'm going to call this one employee skills. And I'm not actually going to put in any columns yet because I'm going to use the relationship tool. And actual fact, this one was botched. Hang on. That's supposed to be a primary key. Try that again. So this is an identifying relationship. And the other one that belongs to this one is the skills. So we're just going to move this guy out of the way. And now we have this piece right here. So the employee skills is an associative entity. It basically associates two other, other entities by having the primary key built up of the primary keys of two other tables. So the an employee can have, in this case, it's set up to be one or more skills, and the skills you know assigned to one or more employees. Uh, realistically, we should be changing the relationship on this, which is that I think. Yes. MySQL Workbench does not make this easy to uh, to change your symbols. Um, they, they used to make it easy, and then they hit it behind a tab on a double click. So we have a skill can be assigned zero more times to this table. An employee can be assigned zero more times to this table. This table basically maps an employee to a skill. And the combination of any employee and any skill can go on only once. In other words, if an em employee one goes into that table, the data would look like this for those that are. You go, say, employee one, skill one, employee one, skill two, employee two, skill one. But the combination of any of these rows cannot be duplicated. That's what that's the magic of this associative entity. You can map many skills to many employees, but any given employee can only have one skill at a time, like a given skill once. Like you're not going to say Dan has PHP three times. Dan has PHP once. Dan has SQL once. SQL can be assigned to Dan and Frank. But Dan and Frank can only ever have SQL. And that's what that does, this particular structure. Now we have the last one, which was the um, I'll, I'll call this uh, employee project time like this. And before I add any more columns, I'm actually going to create the relationships. Again, this one's identifying from here to here and from here to here. Uh, MySQL Workbench is a little strange. Uh, some other design tools, normally you click on the parent and you say, this is the parent of this child. This one you go, this is the child of this parent. You go the other way around. 
you click on the child record first before you click on the parent. Otherwise, what's going to happen is it's going to try to do the relationship the other way. All right. And again, we should make this optional. And close that. And like this. And we just have two more columns to add to this. We have task. Right, we called it task, yep. And uh, time. Now, I'm not gonna say time as a column name because time's a reserved keyword because it's a data type. You try to avoid reserved keywords as your object names because it's not a good thing. So we're going to talk, uh, talk uh, call it uh, task time, and we're going to make that a uh, I don't know a numeric three comma one, and oh come on numeric three comma one close the parentheses. Uh, oh, what? Delete this. That is the numeric. All right. So now, essentially, what I just put on the screen, um, I'm going to get rid of the other stuff so I can zoom in a little bit. Put this here, put this here, put that there, put this here. And there, that's a little bit better. So this is basically what I have on the board. So I took this and turned it into that. Now, is there something else we could do to improve this? In actual fact, I made one last mistake. This should be part of the primary key. There we go. Because over here, we've decided that the time is dependent on the employee number, the project number, and the task that was done. So this table has a really interesting compound key. It's got two foreign keys that participate in its primary key along with a column of its own. So this is actually a really complicated table uh, to work with. Now, when we look at this design, and we think about it, there's still one thing we could do to improve this. Anybody want to take a guess? So I've got the diagram here. I'll put the data back up. And can somebody tell me what the last improvement could be? That's it. So in the end, over here, because we made the task part of the primary key, it was fine. But it's, again, one of those weird edge cases where we had, like, the skill kind of living in the employee. But we may end up with duplicated values in our tasks. So the proper way to do this would be to, um, we're going to edit this table, get rid of this column, create a new table, and we're going to call it tasks. And just to keep naming things like I have been, task number, that's the primary key, task name, excellent. And we could go, uh, hello? Oh, they didn't take my primary key click. Here we go. Try that again. And now we have basically the same structures we had before except we no longer have um, the issue where the task name could be duplicated in that table. So going from this block of text, we ended up with this database structure. Like it's really surprising just how complex the database structure can come from something that looks as simple as what we had before. Now, here's one of the perks of this structure. One, if we need to change the name of an employee, 
We don't need to worry about changing it in multiple places. We need to update a task. It doesn't need to be done in multiple places. We need to change the project description. It doesn't need to be done in multiple places. Employee and skills are easily managed, easily to make sure that it's only one-to-one. -one. Because as it stands, in this structure, theoretically, we could shove Bob in there a third time with, and give him PHP a second time. Because PHP is not part of the key, therefore it can allow duplicated values, which is not great. Um, the tasks are part of the primary key. That means that if we want to change the description of one of the tasks, and as someone that wrote the timesheet system at his day job, it happens where we have a manager that says, you know what? I don't like the fact that we called that task development. We want to call it programming. And I actually had to go in there and change the description of the task because, you know, that one guy didn't like the description. And then every, all the engineers were all confused because then they couldn't find what they were used to picking from the list because nobody told them. But, you know, that's why we want to avoid intelligent identifiers. So, in the end, this structure is first, second, third normal form, and voice cod. It has completely resolved. And by extension, it also is fourth and fifth normal form because, well, Usually when you're in third normal form and you don't have that weird situation where I had that multi-valued list tied to the employee, then it fixes itself. All right, so that was normalization. I will actually do another example uh, probably next week or the week after. So I'll let you guys let this percolate for a little bit. Because what happens often with normalization is students will sit there and go, I got this. They walk out that door and it's like they get a mind wipe and they don't got it. Um, and then they try to do the lab and then it hurts. Um, so I will do a top to bottom example that is slightly better planned because um, I have a few other examples I can use for this. And um, we'll go through it. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of whiteboard, but you know. Would you guys like me to just export this diagram so I can just include it in the announcement? Everybody's sitting there trying to take screens, the pictures of the screen. And for those of you that you know are wondering when you have to use the software for lab uh, four, I think it is. You go, um, you can go export, export as PNG, and then you shove it wherever it needs to go. Uh, week three example, and that way you can upload just the PNG and not screenshot. Because I guarantee some people are going to take a screenshot, and it's going to be that big. Like I'll see this, and I won't be able to read. It. I'm like, I guess that's a zero, because I can't read it. <laughs> um. Anyways, so. Oops, no, that way. All right. So save that. Uh, again, I'm going to also do that as week three example. And I am now going to critique my database design. Just so you guys have, that's not related to today's dis lesson. This is a point where you start looking at database design. You go, oh, I'm doing some really stupid shit. So in here, there's something I absolutely truly detest. I'm going to start with the employees table. This is as a person who's been doing this for long enough that there's certain things that, you know, when you develop certain habits and when people go against that habit, it kind of rubs you the wrong way. The entire time I was doing this, it was hurting me. So here's one of the things that's really dumb. See how I've got employee, employee, employee repeated multiple times in here? Why? There is no reason for that. We know this is the name of an employee because it's in the darn employees table. So if you were going to do this so that it was cleaner, you would probably just go name, oops, email, oops, email. And honestly, this is where my whole, you know, make the primary key called ID. Like this. 
Like, look how nice and clean that is. As opposed to the big, long items. And this will lead me to actually writing a bit of sample code on the board in just a minute. And you'll totally understand why some of this logic exists the way it is. So I'm going to do the rest of the other ones here, which is, again, projects. I'm going to call this ID. Oops. And name. And delete that. Excellent. And skills. ID. Name. ID. Name. All right, so, so far we've got this. The only thing that's happened now that's really weird is the foreign keys all look kind of whack <laughs> because they have, the MySQL Workbench isn't smart enough to know that he needs to go rename the foreign keys. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to change this one to employee ID. And it helps if I'm actually editing it. What? Come on. Somebody has a message on their Samsung. And it probably was my phone. Hey, it's not mine. Okay, excellent. I was pretty sure I actually put mine on do not disturb, but you know. Don't you love the way that phones are identifiable if people don't change their uh, notification sounds? Okay. Let's come back and look at our diagram once more time. One more time. Okay, so here's Dan's revised version of that diagram. You will notice that the column names are much shorter. They are simpler. And I'm actually thinking, thinking of my phone. I'm going to take a picture of the board before I erase it so I can post that for you guys. That'll all come up with the announcement later. Okay, so have you guys seen PHP yet? Okay, do you guys know what, okay, you guys know what JavaScript looks like, right? Okay, PHP won't look that different. I got to do this in PHP because it makes no sense to do this in JavaScript and I don't know Python. So, well, I know Python, but I don't know Python well enough to not embarrass myself in front of you guys as I write code on the board. But PHP is not that different. Okay, so here's the logic behind why this is the way it is. Markers, excellent. So, man, my markers really crash the board, eh? Believe it or not, they are dry erase markers. A little rubbing alcohol. Okay.
And I guarantee this line is wrong, but anyways. Uh, what's it, what the heck's that command called? You know what? I'm going to put out a line of pseudocode because I don't remember that. I don't work with MySQL in the regular. Okay. Yes, you got to deal with my terrible handwriting. So I created a function. I called it get values. I'm passing it two arguments. So so far, it's not that different from JavaScript, right? Except ignore the dollar signs. That's variables in PHP. I'm defining a new variable called SQL. I'm going to go select star from. I'm going to concatenate the name of the table that I passed in, where the ID is equal to the ID that I passed in. The, I, ret I retrieve it. I grab an array of it and I return the array. So now in theory, this one function can retrieve values from any of the strong entities in this database. I don't need to write a separate setter and getter for every database table because each of those tables follows the exact same rules. The primary key is always called ID. And let's just say we didn't want the star. We, we Let's say we just ever want to get the description field, also known as name. If we did select name from table, again, this one function can work with any of the strong entities without having to write a separate function for every table. Magic. This is called writing as little code as you humanly can to get the job done because your database was designed right. It took me a few years to wrap my brain around why that's a good idea. Because I started before there was such a thing as this kind of naming convention. So every time I had to deal with a database table, I literally had to write a separate function or, you know, inline separate code for every table because every table was different. Some tables had names, some had descriptions, some had ID, some had, you know, that weird composite key, whatever. And that one function can be shared amongst the entire code base. And if you find a bug, guess where you need to fix it? In only one place. You don't need to fix it in a dozen, two dozen places, or, you know, like the project I'm currently working on, which has almost 80,000 lines of code in it. When we have to fix bugs, we gotta go crawling through a lot of code to find all the quirks. So that literally is, from unnormalized data to normalized structure to a diagram and then the justification for the naming all in one go today was a brain melt, brain melt um so that is that for today we will be picking up obviously next week same time um i will make a point of trying to post all this to brightspace so that you guys have the examples from today. They'll have to wait till I get home because my phone's not paired to this computer for copying pictures, but it is to my other one. So, so that, I will see you guys in lab or in next class.